Hello, Kavita, can you hear me? Hi, Niharika, madam. Yeah, uh, Vajanta, Hi, can you hear me properly? Yeah, 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 I can hear you. Yeah. yeah, yeah, we can hear each other. Hi, Rajanti. Hi, Hi. Dr. Hi, Kavita. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Yeah. So, Dr. Yash, you are there? You're not seeing my video. Yes, ma'am. Uh -huh. Sorry. There's a problem with my webcam, ma'am. Uh -huh. The video, I'm unable to share the video. What is it? My slides, you're not able to share? No, I'm able to, I'll be, I'm able to share the slides, ma'am, but then the video, there's some problem with that, even after starting. Achha, we are not able to see you, but yes, slides, you just try sharing your slides. Yeah. Uh, we can see your slides. Dr. Niharika, Vajanti, you all can see the slides, no? Oh, yeah, I can see the slides. Yeah. Huh. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so it's okay. Yeah, we can okay. hear you and we can see your slides. So. <laughs> Praveen is supposed to join. He's not joined yet, no? Yeah. yeah, I'll just call him. I'll ask him if he's coming. Yeah, otherwise, we can start in five minutes, 11 o'clock. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I'll be back. I'll just contact him in the meantime, and we'll start at 11. How are you, ma'am? Can't hear you. I need something. Can you hear me now? Can you hear yeah. me now? Ah, yeah, 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 yeah. I can hear you now. Yeah. And I'm just... nee, again, it's disturbed. Now, can you hear me? Ha, it's it's little interrupted. It's. Yeah, maybe maybe what my uh, internet may be a little unstable, I yeah. suppose. Mm -hmm. uh, when is your college starting now? Uh, your vacation I, is over? Vacation is over? Yeah, we're starting from Monday. From Monday. Oh. <laughs> no, Dr. Niharika, you'll have to change your internet to no. something else mm -hmm. because we can't hear you. Okay. Yeah. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll just see I'll just what you can do because uh, for the class may problem. Yeah. Or Vajanti, what's happening? Yeah, it's <laughs> routine. <laughs> Sunday. <laughs> I know it becomes thoda tani. We'll take a break in September. Then we'll yeah. see. Yeah. Yeah. Do yeah. mahina to nikal de. Like July, guest lectures ka pura list hai. Yes, presentation the summer. Bache, bache cover ho gay, puri apke. Uh, yeah, nee, ongoing hai because some people have left, no, the list may lumba list, but some have finished mm -hmm. the fellowship. So mm -hmm. they are not okay. around anymore. Okay. 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 Guest lectures, okay. to hai. case presentation, mm -hmm. catch somebody, mm -hmm. and yeah. then, you know, some of them are not free. Uh, that thing. Mm -hmm. As long as mm -hmm. we can do it, we should do. Right. So, Ravi, is they also, uh, Kavita? This Sorry. along with Yash, there will be one or two more. Yeah, yeah. Shyam is like... there, no? Shyam, okay. you're there? Yes, ma'am. Uh, good morning, ma'am. Uh, yes, I'm there. Uh, wo, so, I'm Chatterjee ka naam dala tha. He's not come. But there are no other students, is it? Kavita, can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah. Now, now you're it's better. It's better? Yes, yes. Okay, yes, then yes. I'll sit outside my hall. I was sitting in the bedroom. Okay. Yeah. Okay. 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 So, uh, seven have joined, out of which uh, students are only Yash and Sham. That's it, no? See okay. if you can get a hold of somebody else to join. Otherwise, you two will have to answer all the questions. <laughs> I'd put one more name, Soham Chatterjee. He's not come yet. And other students also are supposed to join. I'll just put on the group. That please log in. Yeah. Hmm. Dr. Seema Kinney's faculty, no? Yeah, yeah, she's a faculty. She's from which faculty. institute? Mm. Which Nair? She's the one from Nair? No. I don't know from she's born. Yes, Madam Nair. Nair. Yeah, yeah. Um, Bombay Bombay. Group yeah, Bombay Group. Bombay. Yeah, yeah. I'll just see, I'll just log in to the students yeah. and tell them to log in. Then we'll start in two, three minutes. Yeah. Dr. Roni said she'll join around 12. So. Mm -hmm. 
one or two more students should join idhar chhod diya kal kar le soham chatji is joined no dr soham yes ma'am okay great so uh, most of the questions will go to dr yash and yeah. uh, you can direct some to sham and so on then other students who are there like you know dr ajit thomas is from where dr ajit thomas dr ashish jain your could you please introduce yourselves you are from which institution Dr. Seema, you can also introduce yourself, and we'll start in a minute. Yeah, I'm Dr. Seema Kini from Nair Hospital, Mumbai. Okay, great, great. Yeah, welcome. Yeah. Hi. Then, hi. And Dr. R. K. Singh. Okay, fine. Uh, Dr. Praveen is not reachable. So should we start? Hey, Praveen had just hi, displayed hi. his this. Hi, hi. Yeah. Okay, okay, yeah. great. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, so, I was okay. having little trouble in joining. Nah, no problem. Now you are, we are, we can, we are audible. Yeah, we can hear you. Fine. Okay. Uh, so, uh, Dr. Soham, you are uh, yes, you are ready with the slides, no? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. <clears throat> So I welcome you all to the May MRA student teacher interface. Today the presenter is Dr. Yash Desai. He is from um, Navi Mumbai. No, what is the institution? MGM. Uh, D Y Patel. Uh, D Y Patel, Patel Mumbai. Yeah, and his guide is Dr. Manohar Joshi. Yeah. The faculty for today are Dr. Nihara Niharika Gill from Mumbai, Dr. Vijayanti Lagu Joshi, and Dr. Praveen Patel from Pune. So welcome you all. Uh, Soham, you can uh, sorry, Dr. Yash, you can start sharing your slides, and we can start with the case presentation. Sure. So, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, today uh, I'll be presenting a case of a 28-year-old uh, uh, married female housewife, a resident of Kargar, who had presented in our uh, OPD on uh, 27th of uh, January. Uh, 2023 with the history of uh, acute onset, the sudden onset, uh, episodic, severe, symmetrical uh, uh, muscle weakness, which was non-progressive, associated with uh, muscle cramps since uh, three months. Uh, patient has experienced uh, three such episodes, and uh, during these weakness, uh, these episodes, uh, the weakness was uh, such that the patient was uh, unable to get out of her bed in the morning. was unable to lift her arm above the shoulders or stand without uh, any support like uh, she had a uh, generalized weakness and she had uh, such three episodes the first episode was in the month of november uh, on 20th of november the second episode a week later th after that and the third episode was a month later uh, on uh, uh, in during the first episode uh, the patient was uh, taken to a local hospital where uh, she was uh, given uh, only normal saline and the weakness had resolved as we do not have any other documents available ma'am so i was not able to uh, uh, evaluate that uh, specific episode furthermore uh, but on 26th like uh, a week later she experienced a similar episode which was uh, in the morning uh, especially on waking up at that point of time she was uh, taken to a, a hospital where she was hospitalized for a period of 3 days and on uh, investigating her uh, the investigations they uh, revealed a uh, hypokalemia where the uh, potassium levels were uh, quite low when she was treated with uh, uh, intravenous and oral potassium supplements uh, which was followed by uh, immediate resolution of symptoms the patient at that point of time on discharge was given oral potassium supplements which she continued for a period of uh, uh, 10 days after which she stopped them followed by which uh, on 14th of december she again developed the same episode and at that point of time she was hospitalized for a period of one week and at that uh, specific uh, episode her serum potassium levels were found to be uh, around 1.6 milli equivalents per liter a uh, patient uh, does not have any history of uh, fever or joint pain 
there was uh, no history of progression of weakness throughout the day uh, blurring of vision or uh, drooping of eyelids there is no history of uh, malar rash or uh, photosensitivity or any rash over the body no history of dryness of uh, eyes uh, dryness of mouth any oral ulcers or genital ulcers no history of dark colored urine she also does not have any history of diarrhea melina uh, bleeding per rectum or jaundice Uh, there is no history of uh, tingling or numbness or any kind of paresthesia. Uh, she does. She did not have any uh, history of uh, dysphagia to either liquid or solid food. There is no history of uh, dyspnea. Uh, there is also no history of any altered uh, behavior, uh, headache, or trauma uh, before these episodes. Yes. Yes. Ma'am. Can I can I ask 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 a few questions over here? Yes. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Uh, so, by all this negative history, what all yes. differentials you had in mind? That's why you asked all that negative points. Ma'am, as per the history, the patient has been having a, a episodic generalized weakness where she was not able to uh, uh, do any, uh, do any activities of daily life. In the uh, from the negative history, ma'am, while uh, ruling out fever and or any joint pain, we were ruling out uh, either any uh, infectious cause of. Uh, uh, quadriparesis or generalized okay, infectious causes of quadriparesis acute uh, onset acute uh, onset uh, diphtheria uh, polio uh, enterovirus uh, either in cases or also in cases of lyme's disease <laughs> uh, in india <laughs> just and at this age yeah sorry ma'am okay some questions uh, can you can you hear me No, no. Uh, no, no, no. Yes, you are presenting a neuro case. Okay, yes, you are yes, presenting a neuro case. So your history should be complete regarding your uh, all the four limbs weakness. Uh, you have taken in your stride that it is a, a, a RTA with serum uh, potassium sulfate. I, yes, as an examiner for a MD and a DNB medicine or a PG, you will be your history for quadriplegia is not complete. Yes, ma'am. You understood what I'm talking? Uh, right. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. So have you, and see, this is like you have not started with the history that patient has got. Okay, sudden weakness. Yes, But is the power same all that uh, all the, uh, limbs? Was the patient having any occipital headache, pain uh, radiating somewhere, or a transient loss of consciousness? That history is not there in your early presentation. Okay, okay so fine. that is missing. So you okay. cannot take it for granted anything because the examiners will each of us have a different uh, thought process. So you should yes. be able to present like a neuro case. Okay. So yes, don't take it as a negative thing. I'm just trying to tell you right, where you are going wrong. Okay. Yes, 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 yes. And, and when and see, he's covering a few points in your his negative history. I think yes, no, no, no. But what you know, points. what uh, no, Vajanti, what he's doing yes. now, he is not. If you are presenting as a quadriplegia, your mm -hmm. history for uh, neuro case uh, presentation yes. should be up, uh, more in the upper five, not like no malarash, no this, no diarrhea. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. then he's talking about altered behavior yes. and headache and paresthesia. It should mm -hmm. have come in oh, association yes. with okay. quadriparesis. You understood? So yes, there, like, uh, like I'm, uh, uh, Dr. Desai, don't feel offended. So just no, to teach you on your uh, case presentation. Okay, yes, that's what I do in my medical college. Okay, right. chalo. Uh, Ma'am, uh, uh, while ruling out uh, any history mm -hmm. of uh, progression of weakness throughout the day uh, or blurring of vision or any eyelid drooping, I was uh, ruling out any uh, neuromuscular junction disorder like myasthenia gravis. Mm -hmm. True. Uh, uh, with the history of uh, coming to any altered behavior, headache or trauma, mm -hmm. uh, the patient, I, I was ruling out any uh, transient ischemic attacks or any mm -hmm. uh, neurological cause, upper motor neuron cause, ma'am. You will mm -hmm. say altered behavior, or will you use the word loss of transient or loss of uh, transient consciousness? The oh, altered must... behavior is like I was talking about neurology case. You say transient loss of consciousness. Got yes, it? Yes, ma'am. Got it. Can't hear you. I got it, ma'am. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. 
Okay, uh, continue. Continue. Yes, ma'am. while coming to uh, no history of malar rash photosensitivity ma'am that uh, from the rheumatological uh, point of view i had just uh, ruled out whether the patient has any uh, photosensitivity or any other uh, uh, cutaneous lesions which could go in the favor of uh, lupus erythematosus uh, patient uh, uh, also has no history of uh, dryness of eyes mouth i was ruling out the sicca symptoms in this patient ma'am any oral ulcers or genital ulcers uh, no history of uh, dark colored urine uh, for uh, history of uh, uh, myoglobin urea mm -hmm. was there any, hmm. yes, what is the most important uh, symptom to rule out the other causes for uh, this acute flaccid quadriparesis i mean whether it was a painful thing or it was a painless thing ma'am it was painless but it was associated with a few muscle cramps ma'am Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but then there was no uh, tenderness on uh, uh, palpating the muscle mm -hmm. so that pain becomes an important factor to differentiate yes, a few differentials yeah yes ma'am yes ma'am okay hmm uh, ma'am uh, uh, no history of any tingling or numbness mm -hmm. to rule out any uh, uh, neuropathy neuropathic cause ma'am mm -hmm. uh, no, there is no history of uh, dysphagia or uh, dyspnea any uh, Uh, to not any esophageal dysmotility and dyspnea uh, for respiratory muscle weakness ma'am yeah it is mainly the bulbar involvement what yes, you want to talk yeah mm -hmm. these were the uh, causes why uh, okay. i ruled out these specific But things ma'am were there any do. other precipitating causes before these uh, episodes of quadriparesis uh, no ma'am uh, other uh, mentions from patient Uh, no, ma'am. Like anxiety, depression, or any such. Uh, uh... No. Uh, suppose I say, uh, the doctor, this side. Suppose I say the patient has, and followed by quadriplegia. So, what will be your uh, differential on this setting in this young patient? Ma'am, uh, ma'am, actually, your voice was breaking, ma'am. Uh, so the patient has fever. Fever. Okay, fever. a uh, fever and quadriplegia so what will be the differential in this setting it could be associated with uh, either diphtheria ma'am or uh, no it's no. just because <coughs> the allergy case na so in the metallurgy ma'am uh, could be uh, gullian barre syndrome Hmm. Our uh, transverse myelitis. Our representing as sudden. Yes. So, which are the diseases in college which can present with speech? Which are the diseases which could hmm. present with fever and uh, this one? Transverse myelitis presenting as quadriplegia. This one. first presentation first presentation the student who are watching can they can get the answer one some loose motions for give, no, no 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 i'll give you a I'll, no no i'll give you a hint also here doctor bill can pilo back to ma'am now doctor bill and said a case is in dramat and dramatic boredom uh, chalo i'll give you the answer lupus uh, new lupus uh, neuropsychiatric lupus you can press suddenly yeah okay chalo okay. um can i uh, move ahead yeah yeah please please yeah. go ahead uh, past history uh, no history of uh, similar episodes in the past a uh, patient does not have any history of tuberculosis diabetes hypertension or uh, thyroid disorder no history of any surgical illness in the past uh, she denies uh, any uh, addictions uh, her sleep and appetite are adequate and bowel and bladder movements are not altered uh, no history of uh, similar complaints in the family members or no history of any other illness in family members ma'am uh, she is a uh, obstetric history ma'am she is nalli gravida is family history uh, important here yes dr yes why is the family history important 
ma'am if the uh, there are similar complaints uh, in the family if it could be because of uh, um, channelopathies or no, i can't hear be... you hello hello yes we can't hear you hello can you hear me ma'am yes i can hear we can i hear. can hear yes <laughs> ha yes 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 go on i asked uh, why is this family history important in this case of episodic paralysis dr yash ma'am to or dr soham ha huh? it could be uh, familial hypokalemia yes. or any uh, channelopathies yeah. how many channelopathies are to be come across Mm. see uh, uh, tell me all the causes of you know what the madam is trying to uh, get an answer from you is hereditary causes of rta with hypokalemia okay so can you tell me which what the genetic defect or which are the syndromes associated with hypokalemia uh ma'am uh... because you said na family history young patient yes ma'am so you should know Yeah, so but talk. Uh, man, Fanconi syndrome could be very good. Fanconi syndrome, very good, and some are hereditary causes also because of genetic mutation. Okay, very yes. What else? When the familial hypokalemic periodic paralysis, familial hyperkalemic periodic paralysis are known to yes, ma'am. Run in families, so that family episodic paralysis. Okay. Yeah, and what about this bladder bowel involvement you mentioned, and uh, what did that rule out? No, many uh, uh, spinal cause, ma'am. In your history, ma'am, spinal cause. Yeah, it is basically the myelitis part that yes, you in, uh, ruled out in this, right? Yes, ma'am. Then, see, uh, yes, the patient yes, has got all four limbs weakness. Thyroid, you mentioned. So, what, are, what is so the importance of thyroid level, in this case? Yeah, yeah. The so level should be higher in hmm. the cervical area. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Hmm. It's uh, it could it should be in the cervical area. Hmm. So tell me causes where the cervical uh, cervical uh, vertebra is involved where they can give you quadriplegias. Most common cause. Like ma'am, uh, the in, upper motor uh, neuron causes ma'am uh, that could be. Uh, no, no, no. In rheumatology, in rheumatology, yes, in rheumatology, uh, okay, the most common cause of <coughs> quadriplegia. I've got Tikka syndrome, so it's a little dry mouth. Okay, sir. Okay. Bolo. Ma'am, uh, yeah, Atlanta oxyl uh, yeah, dislocation, ma'am, in uh, cases of uh, uh, rheumatoid arthritis. Yeah, very good. So, what will be the Clinical presentation. That's why I was asking you in the yes, uh, weakness. What will be the clinical presentation of a C1 C2 involvement? Ma'am, the patient would uh, present with uh, weakness of all four limbs associated with uh, bowel or uh, bladder uh, uh, involvement. No, no, bladder bowel doesn't come so fast here. Oh, sorry, ma'am. Uh, What will be the first if I have a RA patient, 15 years of uh, presentation? She, and i am suspecting c1 c2 subluxation yes, what will be the presentation with patient will be coming to the doctor all the time and we are not really listening to the patient mm. we are listening to the patient uh, ma'am tingling sensation over her uh, over the no. uh, upper limbs no the no, first thing no. they always pain. say pain uh, did they have a pain in the back of their occiput mm. Okay. You know yeah. that is the thing, and we go on neglecting. That is because the skin C two radio it uh, supplies your oxygen, na, piche ka pa posteriorly. So that is the clinical presentation. And the second yeah. clinical presentation, kya hoega other than pain? What what do we do with the neck? We flex and extend, na. Yes, ma'am. So when we flex the neck, what will happen? Sudden flexion of your neck. Then that would uh, cause uh, uh, electric-like sensations. That uh, that okay, hermit sign. Anything else? Hermit sign. Anything else? Yes, ma'am. Hermit sign. Anything else? Transient loss of consciousness. Okay, ma'am. Okay. Sorry. Okay. Yes. 
any any other uh, rheumatological diseases which causes the uh, involvement of C1C2 L uh, less common but it is there in long history other other yeah, it is again a uh, case axial and spine very yeah, good yeah. And, and spine very good and spine so now i'll ask you two questions Uh, yes, what will be the difference of subluxation of C1C2 in uh, rheumatoid arthritis versus an angst pond? So you are going to be at DNB Rheumata, huh? so you should be knowing all this. Yes, any of the rest, uh, any of the PGs can answer. Okay, sure. no problem. Ma'am, can you repeat? The range of motion would be restricted in cases of uh, long-standing RA. A uh, long-standing AS with neurology of the cord compression. C one C two either is an anterior and a posterior dislocation. Okay, and yes. in AS it's a upward dislocation. Upward dislocation. So all the small small things, na, you have yes. to uh, mark while reading your books. Okay, chalo. Got it. Ka carry on. Carry on. Yes, ma'am. Uh, coming to the physical examination, <coughs> uh, the pulse is 94 uh, beats per minute, uh, regular. Blood pressure is 100 by 70 millimeters of mercury in both arms. Uh, no evidence of uh, uh, pallor, uh, ictus, lymphadenopathy, sinusitis, clubbing, and edema. Uh, on general examination, her skin appeared to be normal. Uh, oral mucosa was normal. Uh, the respiratory system, uh, 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 it was uh, normal. Vascular system was normal. Joint examination revealed no tenderness or any kind of swelling. Uh, coming to the uh, systemic examination, ma'am, uh, cardiovascular, respiratory system, and per abdomen was uh, unremarkable. Uh, on doing the nervous system examination, higher mental functions were normal. With uh, uh, and the cranial nerve examination also did not show any uh, abnormality. Uh, coming to the examination of uh, motor system, her muscle bulk was normal and her muscle tone was normal on the day of presentation to us, ma'am. Uh, uh, power in uh, the upper limb, uh, uh, proximal as well as distally, uh, uh, it was grade five. Uh, and in the lower limb, hip, knee, and ankle, it was grade five. Uh, deep tendon reflexes were 2 plus normal and uh, plantar reflexes were uh, bilaterally flexor. Uh, sensory system examination revealed no sensory deficits and tests for coordination were also intact. Uh, Ma'am, after this, coming to the uh, investigations. Told about the other systems, all are open? Yes, ma'am. Muscular skeleton. Uh, Ma'am, uh, I had uh, joint, uh, during the joint examination, there was no tenderness or uh, swelling or no restriction of movement, no abnormality was found, ma'am. So, what is the working diagnosis, Dr. Desai? Uh, Ma'am, uh, she is... Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, uh, may, uh, coming to a provisional diagnosis based on the history and examination, ma'am, uh, she's a 28-year-old uh, uh, married female who presented with uh, episodic acute, three episodes of acute onset generalized weakness where she was not able to do uh, anything with no uh, upper motor neuron signs or uh, the lower motor neuron signs on day of presentation. But based on the history of the patient, it looks like it looks more like the uh, element type of pattern. In that also, ma'am, uh, as we ruled out uh, uh, muscle tenderness, also we it could uh, there could there are uh, other uh, differences like it may be because of uh, electrolyte uh, imbalances or. Uh, Mainly because of electrolyte imbalances, ma'am, or any other uh, neuropathy. So, But, uh, so yes, yeah. So you are uh, so you are narrow downing your narrow down your uh, uh, DD. So what is your first DD in this kind of, in this patient? The first differential. Ma'am, the first differential uh, could be ma'am uh, neuropathy. The second dif and second differential uh, it could be. Listen, listen, listen. Uh, listen, you have given all the positive and negative findings. 
Yes, Theoretically, you are not finding it. You have to say it. A young patient coming with episodic quadriplegia and with uh, it becomes all right. And potential diagnosis will be on dealing with the hypothalamic paralysis. Yes, and sir. then we talk about your other days. You understand? That yes, is your narrowing down your DDs. Because episodic, you know, teen chala, pain ho jata chati. Which patient will become all right? MND patient will become all right. So that's how the answer is the exam. Patient becomes yes, all right so with the treatment. Your right, working right. diagnosis will be uh, hypokalemic periodic. Periodic paralysis. So now you can investigate now. Sir. Yes, Anything else that can cause episodic quadriparesis? Yeah. Besides, yeah. Uh, I think. Um, uh, if there are any uh, inborn errors of yeah. uh, uh, impaired carbohydrate uh, yeah. utilization or uh, impaired fatty acid mm -hmm. utilization. Metabolic mm -hmm. myopathies, they yes, are intermittent, you know, exercise related. Yeah. Yes, so, ma'am. Young people, episodic. There may be family history, yeah, carbohydrate related. Ma'am, um, yeah, multiple, multiple sclerosis also. Yes, I was going to explain to us. Heart uh, stretch, but you will keep multiple sclerosis as the second dimension. Yes, the main yeah, difference is that this is pure motor, according to you. Head. No? Yeah, and there is no but bladder is involvement. Pure motor, yeah. 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 There is in multiple sclerosis, the plaques could be anywhere. So you yes, could get sensory motor, bladder involvement, etc. Dr. Praveen, you want to ask? Real element, I think, I think that is one of the important things. Yes. Dr. Praveen, you're there? Yes, ma'am, I'm listening. I will talk in the end. Achha, and Vajanti, you got the connectivity? <laughs> we got Praveen, we'll ask the final questions. Yeah, I'm little bit interrupted. I, I don't know. Everybody is having the same interruptions. I'm not able to listen to all content. I don't know. Uh, no, I can not hear can... Dr. Niharika sometimes. But the student is clear. Yeah. No, in the voice is breaking, I think. There is some... Oh, I can't uh -huh. say. Even I'm struggling. Okay, but that's why I thought I will, yeah, I will talk right. in the end. And uh, uh, Dr. Gil and Dr. Lagu Joshi, ma'am, can uh, take the questions now. Okay, okay. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Uh, I'm coming to the... <laughs> no, no, we uh, also intervene. <laughs> okay, can go ahead. Hmm. Uh, coming to the uh, investigations, ma'am. Uh, <laughs> These are the serial investigations uh, which we had. So I just uh, put them up in a tabular form, ma'am. Uh, the patient, uh, patient CBC uh, was fine, ma'am. Uh, her uh, in November as well as in January. Uh, her ESR was uh, 31 in the month of uh, November and it was 122 at the time she uh, uh, consulted us, ma'am. Uh, her... Uh, Creatinine was normal, ma'am. Her serum potassium was found to be 1.6 in uh, November, and uh, on it, it was found to be 3.2 when she had uh, uh, seen us, ma'am, the other day. Uh, LFTs were uh, normal, uh, ma'am. Her CPK was found to be raised in the first uh, uh, episode, ma'am. We I, uh, found an investigations which showed uh, the uh, levels of CPK were raised at. 1823. But uh, when she had seen us on repeating her uh, CPK total, it was found to be 209. Her uh, CRP was 2.77 and uh, it was 1 milligrams per liter. Uh, her ANA by IF was positive 1 is to 640, uh, 3 plus in a with a speckled pattern. Anti CCP was uh, negative, ma'am. A triple H was negative, serum calcium and magnesium, uh, they were also in the normal range. Her urine routine, it showed a pH of uh, 6.1, then an alkaline pH with uh, 1 plus protein and 5 to 6 WBCs per hypower field. Her uh, uh, ABG analysis, it showed a pH of 7.2, uh, PCO2 of 16.5, bicarb was uh, 8.9. Uh, urinary uh, sodium was found to be 36, uh, potassium 14.6 and chloride was uh, 46 with a urinary anion gap of uh, 4.6, positive uh, anion gap. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Her uh, ANA profile was done which uh, revealed a strong positivity for uh, SSA and SSB rho and la. Uh, on, uh, after these investigations, a Sermos test was done which was uh, negative, ma'am. 
her chest x-ray usg abdomen uh, pelvis was also unremarkable there was no abnormality uh, uh, detected mri plain uh, showed mri brain plain uh, showed a normal study uh, no abnormalities were seen ma'am to uh, shall i move ahead these were the total investigations which were done in this patient uh, to summarize ma'am uh, uh, a 28 year old female with uh, three episodes of acute onset weakness of all four limbs in uh, three months which uh, resolved with uh, iv and intravenous and oral uh, potassium supplementations uh, with investigations uh, revealing uh, uh, hypokalemia abg suggestive of uh, slight metabolic acidosis with an alkaline ph of uh, urine and a positive uh, urinary anion gap which was suggestive of uh, uh, distal uh, renal tubular acidosis also the patient has positivity for uh, uh, ssa and ssb which uh, uh, to uh, to the provisional diagnosis would be hypokalemic uh, periodic uh, paralysis due to distal uh, renal tubular uh, acidosis in a patient of uh, sjogren's syndrome how often do you get renal involvement in sjogren Dr. Yash, ma'am, ma the prevalence is around uh, uh, 10 to 15 percent. But ma'am, uh, I have only seen two such cases till date. Mm hmm. Yes, And what kind of renal involvement do you see in Jogren? Uh, ma'am, it could be uh, tubular interstitial nephritis. Mm hmm. And uh, along with that, uh, if uh, severe cases, we could also see glomerular nephritis, ma'am. Uh, it could be either membranous or membrano proliferative type of glomerular nephritis. Mm -hmm. so would, uh, would you like to subject this patient for kidney biopsy um, uh, for the sake of diagnosing it uh, yes i would why <laughs> it's a clear cut <laughs> Clear cut, yes, ma'am. It is clear cut. Ah, no, no. So that is the biopsy. I just asked I because your urine. You you mentioned about urine showing some protein urea. You mentioned yes, about One urine minutes. showing. So was that really significant kind of protein urea, or was it associated with any urinary infection that time? Some five six WBCs, protein one plus. So. No, but ma'am, five to six WBCs in a female patient. Do you really suspect any kind of glomerular nephritis yeah. in this patient? Uh, no, ma'am, not mm. really. I would mm. uh, rather repeat another uh, mm. uh, urine routine to again look for any casts or crystals if there are any, and RBCs. That would be a five. logical thing to repeat the urinary okay. samples and look for the persistent protein urea or pyuria or active sediment. If at all we are suspecting glomerular nephritis, yes, ma'am. Yeah. <coughs> Then the classical findings of this distal RTA. Uh, ma'am. Uh, I mean, questions can go on RTA. Yes, What are the types of RTA? I mean, those are theory questions, but you can. And there are uh, four types of uh, RTA. You should be prepared for that. The types of different renal tubular acidosis and how do you really diagnose RTA? what are the uh, the key features of rta here you mentioned in your lab ma'am uh, in uh, this patient in our patient uh, the patient has an alkaline urine ph mm -hmm. slight metabolic acidosis mm -hmm. uh, uh, where it shows a ph of 7.2 and bicarb of only 8.9 along with a positive urinary anion gap ma'am mm -hmm. So if it is uh, positive, if the anion gap is urinary anion gap is positive, it goes more to in the favor of distal yes. RTA mm -hmm. in the setting of uh, metabolic acidosis. Basically, madam, mm -hmm. it's a type one, type two, type three, type four RTA. Mm -hmm. How do you differentiate on labs? But they all look the same. The clinical presentation will be the same here. So how do you differentiate between drugs? Because the causes will be different. Yes, ma'am. Cause will be different. Yeah. So, can you tell me other than other causes, other causes of uh, RTA other than your Sjogren's and uh, rheumatoid arthritis and lupus and all that? Ma'am, um, it could What also be other seen causes? in uh, cases of amyloidosis. Yes. And if uh, yes, in uh, uh, infective causes like uh, HIV/AIDS, ma'am. Yes, mm -hmm. and and uh, uh, CLD, cirrhosis of liver. So okay, I'll, as an I'm going to ask any drugs nephrologist. As a nephrologist, RTA? which are the kidney causes of giving rise to RTA? Kidney causes. Kidney. 
नहीं ड्रग्स नहीं डिजीजेस मेडुलर रिस्पांस किडनी मैम एनीथिंग एल्स ड्रग्स आई आस्क निहारी का मैडम आस्क अबाउट किडनी कॉजेस थी ऑब्स्ट्रक्टिव यूरोपैथी कैन कॉज यस या वेरी गुड एंड एंड विल्सन yeah any infection chronic infections going on for long time you i can yeah. cause and what are the medications any common head. medications which can lead to rta ma'am amphotericin b lithium yeah, uh, yeah. and i phosphamide can cause ma'am uh, yeah. rta yes, ma very common and uh, apart apart from this ma'am hyperparathyroidism uh, vitamin d intoxication and drugs what uh, even we come across they, they are in use <laughs> and hematological uh, cause mm-hmm. ibuprofen ma'am uh, and said yeah. ma'am ibuprofen can also cause rta ma'am Mm-hmm. and said <coughs> and uh, lithium ma'am uh, that is commonly prescribed for bipolar mood, mood disorders ma'am so that can also mm-hmm. cause uh, rta mm-hmm. sarcoidosis can also uh, could be a cause of rta mm-hmm. hematological causes hemat causes which can cause uh, rta mm-hmm. sickle cell disease in the present uh, more than that more than that multiple myeloma small uh, chain cancers all those things you know so uh, we have to rule out we should and even paraneoplastic syndrome can present uh, in no case like your quadriparesis because we uh, you have to give your differential in the exams every possible disease and yes. conclusion will be your sugren syndrome okay yes ma'am and now i won't be asking any question now praveen patel will be uh, questioning from now okay praveen now i should be hearing from you now Hello. Great. Hi. Um, so, thank you. Um, uh, yes, excellent case presentation. Uh, I hope I'm audible. Yes. 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 Okay. Great. And uh, thank you, uh, Niharika, ma'am, and Dr. Lag Joshi. Um, I got that shiver off my exam when I was going through uh, when you were talking about that. So, uh, see, see, the 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 medical teachers have different vibe when they start talking. It's completely different. and uh, no matter how many years you have done the private practice but when teacher <laughs> you get that uh, same thing again but great so most uh, some of the questions were difficult i didn't know the answer to be honest theek okay. hai what uh, dr gill was asking what the pearls she was sharing with us about the differentiating between the c1 c2 and all those initial presentation excellent to learn from uh, from the teachers so uh, 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 so here uh, i will just briefly summarize i think lot of it i could not hear so some of it may be con- yeah. uh, covered al- already so we were talking about the acute flaccid paralysis so the 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 etiology could be like compressive and non compressive so compressive can be infective or the inflammatory causes and the non compressive can be transverse myelitis or a demyelinating syndrome as well sometimes they can be associated with autoimmune diseases functional causes is another one which can be very difficult to differentiate in some patients if it is a functional cause for that the, the chynelopathy i think that was discussed it is usually iron iron channel mutation and normally it is the calcium channel less commonly sodium channel and then the then the two causes familial and and the acquired causes um, and then the presentation can be self limiting as well so this is important one to remember that the body tries to compensate as well and in some patient they recover on their own um and the presentation can be uh, really uh, difficult particularly when starts uh, when the patient goes to the bed uh, absolutely fine and then next day morning or in the middle of night they have difficulty in uh, getting up from the bed no no sometime it can be incomplete that it involves lower limbs more than the upper limbs and in clinical scenario in real life it is not the textbook picture all the time and it can become really challenging to identify this thing i will share with you my experience uh, of recent patient so a patient with uh, uh, overlap connective tissue disease ra and i think it was lupus i gave her rituximab she got admitted for rituximab by the end of uh completing her rituximab she felt weird sensation in the lower limbs and she had difficulty in moving one limb okay and then they gradually progress to the second limb and uh, and then the story so you can imagine the panic in the ward uh, what what everyone will blame to rituximab <laughs> correct okay so i got uh, almost 100 calls from all over the places ki are tumhi aushadh det hote ani tyachani he sagal asa dhal okay so and uh, and it's very difficult to come to any conclusion in that short period of time for anyone right 
whether it's the drug which is rare as a uh, presentation of that retrospectively it's all easy then the neurologist got involved and all that but to, to cut the long story short basically somewhat had given her dextrose and probably that triggered the hypokalemia yeah. and it was hypokalemic periodic paralysis but before we come to that conclusion the hell broke loose the she had mri scan and you name it and i was not there and this usually happens when you are not there or reachable and if you cannot assess patient physically it's difficult to know so this this can happen so what we should know is about the triggers so yes this patient has hypokalemic periodic paralysis uh, tendency to have that but why this happened on that day so what are the triggers so do you know what are the triggers yes sir meet me Doctor Desai. Yes, sir. What are the Let triggers? Triggers could be. Okay, so triggers one carbohydrate diet. Correct. You mentioned that, right? So that that that. But what happens when they take carb carbohydrate diet? How does it trigger hypokalemia? So strenuous exercise, stress, various things have been identified. Steroid use, we do give steroid before giving rituximab. It can be one of the trigger, right? Um, then carbohydrate diet. So all this, what it leads to is the intracellular shift of the potassium. Okay. So the potassium from the serum goes inside the cells. And that's why there is a, a serum level of hypokalemia. And that leads to uh, the hypokalemic periodic paralysis. So that can be the then the the causes can be the for the in general the loss of potassium can be through the kidneys or can be through the another cause of the potassium loss. Gut, sir. Right. Yeah. So we yeah. So it could be GI uh, problem as well, right? So that <laughs> that's a possibility. And you mentioned about the kidney causes, right? Uh, the nephrocalcinosis is one of the cause mentioned in there as well. Yeah. Um, usually, uh, the respiratory muscles and all that are spared in this. So that it may help you to come to some sort of a conclusion uh, in this in this uh, in this type of scenario. Uh, last thing I would like to mention is I have shared in the chat a paper by our own Dr. Sandhya. This is the Indian paper or 400 plus patients she has studied. Uh, there is a link as well and a conclusion I have shared. You all must read. Uh, this doctor is in Delhi. I don't know her personally, but she's doing a lot of work in Sjogren's. Fantastic original work uh, she has done. Uh, so I think we all must read the papers and the Indian data, uh, particularly about the Sjogren's and RTA. That's it. I don't have any questions or anything. This is. I hope it, it was clear to you all. Yes, yes, yes. Dr. Niharika, Dr. Vajant, we have about five to ten minutes five more. Minutes. <laughs> yes, you can ask more questions, I think, on Shogrins and Anishwara. Uh, this patient, I think, is a little a typical case still, I find, Kavita, because uh -huh. it's a very young, I mean, whatever age group we see for Shogrin is around four to fifth decay, but this is a very young female and a young age of onset. And doesn't have any other classical glandular features what we see with Jogre. Uh, you already mentioned about this eye involvement, lacrimal and uh, this uh, parotid and all. So that way she is not really having the classical other Jogre features at present except the antibodies. So what do you think for Jogre, Yash? Uh, what exactly do you need to diagnose it as Jogre? Do you get this SSA or SSB positive in other situations other conditions also apart from rheumatoid or apart from jogrin uh, yes ma'am do you get those antibodies positive in other conditions uh, yes ma'am but i am a country any other just name name a few conditions which can uh, which can have these antibodies positive, positive. Autological conditions i where it can be associated with Chopin syndrome. Mm -hmm. um, in SLE, ma'am, we can get uh, SLE. SLE. Okay. Yeah. Rheumat and there are rheumatoid rheumat 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 Yes, ma'am. RA is a very common condition where you get SSA positive. RA yes. Very common. Then any Which condition you are low 50. Okay, tell Sorry. me about row 52 and pregnancy. What happens? 
if the patient is pregnant with the rogue 52 positive. Chances of congenital heart block is there, ma'am. Neonatal lupus, ma'am. Any non rheumatological conditions where you get this row positive? Anybody? Yes, Soham or. I mean, I don't know. We in practice are seeing this anti SSA row positivity in. Very few other conditions like interstitial lung diseases. They I often know. come with SSA RO52 positive, or there are few neuropathies which can have this SSA RO52 positive, but they do not have the other features of Jogren. So, uh, this SSA RO52 uh, are then un unclassified uh, or undifferentiated connective tissue disorders, which generally we get this SSA RO52 positive. And we don't get any other features of classical rheumatological condition or prototype. So that this SSARO52 is a very tricky antibody to interpret, I think, because it can come in other scenarios also and do suggest, does suggest some kind of autoimmunity, but may not have all the features of Jogren or a classical prototype every time. And where is it located, by the way, RO52? Or uh, uh, what are the two types of anti SSA? Yes. Yes, ma'am. What are the what are the types of uh, anti SSA? Um, ma'am, uh, I don't know, ma'am. Actually, uh, the row has got two uh, varieties. Row. Row, 50 row 16, row, 16. Row, row 52. Yeah. Row 52 and so are they, are, they, are they same or they, are, they, are, they, they behave differently? Ma'am, uh, row 60 is associated with sickle symptom chagrin. Uh, row 52 is associated with uh, congenital heart block, uh, congenital lupus, ma'am. Uh, they behave differently, ma'am. <laughs> they are different because the weights uh, are different and even the locations are different. Yes. Where is RO52 yes. located? Huh? I'll ask you the last question uh, as an exam case. Uh, yes, if a patient of Sjogren syndrome comes uh, comes to your clinic after many many years, and now she has she's been running fever, she's lost weight, okay, and the ESR is very very high. So what would you think? What complication you must think, and what uh, investigation you will consider in this patient of a primary Sjogren syndrome? Because that Sjogren, Sjogren syndrome sounds very simple. Yeah, dryness of eyes and dryness of mouth. Uh, mm -hmm. They may come later with uh, something which uh, you have to keep in mind. So that is why for every follow-up they ask, they can be lost weight, fever, new symptoms. Lymphoma. Lymphoma. Yes. Lymphoma. Yeah, so you have to always keep in mind lymphoproliferation. Yes malignancy yes. because I had one patient she was a, a microbiologist you know she was a teacher and her, she came after 10 years because she thought sika syndrome kya jane ka gil madam ke paas ghadi ghadi. and when she came she had developed all the signs and symptoms of malignancy okay mm -hmm. so you have to keep uh, your uh, lymphoproliferative lymphoma in mind all the patients are uh, matic diseases don't keep like always consider it is just a uh, rheumatological disease. Yes, ma'am. And uh, the last question for you, uh, this Dr. Desai. Yes, now, yes, suppose uh, this patient is a case of lupus. I just changed from your children to lupus. Yes, and uh, what are the CNS manifestations in the lupus which may mimic uh, multiple sclerosis, may mimic a quadriplegia? May mimic a paraneoplastic syndrome, may mimic a neurobeshes or a sarcoid. So tell me the a neuropsychiatric manifestation of lupus. Chalo. Start from start now. From brain to the uh, to the legs. <laughs> okay. New, neuropsychiatric manifestations of lupus. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Ma'am, the patient would uh, present with uh, uh, seizures, psychosis.
start from the uh, psychological type of risk and the brain parenchyma. What happens to the brain parenchyma? No. Have you have you come across the word like uh, uh, gray matter lupus and white matter lupus? Yes, ma'am. If you have not, then re then read it. If you have not, so because I'm just uh, I'm making you to read. And lupus, you get a lot of small fiber neuropathy. Then you have to differentiate lupus with your uh, NMO spectrum disease. What is NMO? Full form of NMO? Neuromyelitis optica, ma'am. Yeah, so. Can you uh, so you have to keep in mind lupus yes, can present your uh, autoimmune uh, uh, CNS diseases can present Lyme's virus can present yes, can uh, can APS present like this APS APS can, uh, yeah um, catastrophic APS could present like this. no 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 quadriplegia sorry ma'am presenting as a four limb weakness. Can they present? It can, ma'am, uh, if there is some uh, thrombotic uh, event that yeah. has taken place, ma'am. Okay. Uh, ma'am, other uh, neurological manifestations, oh. it could be patient could have... Uh, what is press? Posterior what is full form of press? Yeah. yeah. So can we, yeah. can we see it in uh, lupus? It can present in lupus. It can present also. in lupus, yes. Yeah. So all these small, small things now, which we come across in a day-to-day -day clinical practice in a neurology patients yes. coming to medical college. So uh, just because we are rheumatologists, we should not be just giving your first DD as a rheumatic patient. Yes, ma'am. Things so, and then you will never make, you know what Dr. Vyad Joshi should tell us when I was a houseman, think as an internist first, rule out all the, Medics can bring your rheumatological causes and you will never make a mistake. Okay? Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Dr. Jayesh. I think so. Yes, Desai, I think so. the case presentation is over. And over to our uh, convener, Dr. Kavita. Thank you, Dr. Niharika, Dr. Vejanti, and Dr. Praveen for today's uh, faculty uh, taking out your time and being there as faculty today would you like to just give a little short we have two minutes we can just give a little short feedback to the student where he can improve he's still exam going just one line by each of you and then we'll go for the guest lecture okay Jesh, i have already told you where, i just have told you already where you went wrong in the when the, you yes, started your case presentation it's a new road so think as a MD medicine, you have got a neuro case of quadriplegia and then gradually add your, uh, you know, clinical history and findings of a rheumatological disease. Okay. And this yes, ma'am. Good. Dr. Bajan, yeah, I agree with yeah. Harika. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. You had a very good presentation, the, the history and the details of it, the negative history. You had mentioned it very well. Uh, I think the investigation part was also good, but I think you should be prepared about the other questions which come up on that like yes, as i mentioned about this uh, anti-ssa anti-ssb not only that now no, novel antibodies which are coming up in jobrin so you should be aware of that the the yes. treatment part unfortunately we didn't discuss but that is very very important for such cases how long you treat and how do you treat further this hypokalemic periodic paralysis that is very yes, very important later so i think that treatment part we we didn't have a time to discuss but that we should be really focusing on then no. uh, but otherwise your presentation was good and let's keep on reading dr praveen you're there yes uh, so yeah. good case excellent uh, dr desai uh, you got all the feedback uh, so there's a long way to go anyway i'm sure you will learn all these things uh, uh, in your clinical practice i have shared a couple of links for you to read the articles in the chat box uh, yes. read that uh, something probably you should read and think about is does immunosuppression help in rta manifestation uh, mm -hmm. so we all rheumatologists like to go with all the drugs we know, but does it help in RTA manifestation? Does it help in the chinalopathy type of presentation? And uh, then the, I have shared one article on the antibodies associated uh, with chogrin. So apart from ROLA, even things like the presence of anti-CCP help in establishing the diagnosis, where we call it seronegative chogrins. Uh, yes. 
uh, the ultrasound of the salivary gland uh, can help you. Some typical uh, typical uh, manifestations are there, which we can look up on the salivary gland ultrasound. Or sometimes we end up doing the lip biopsy, which can be a very simple thing to do, not very uh, invasive process. Um, so th those are the things probably you need to yes. read about. Praveen, can you send the links and the M? Yeah, you can send it on the group so that because the chat box will close, so you can group? share it on the yeah. students will, and the faculty group. Yeah, yeah. because uh, yes, the participants can, can are yes. twenty-eight. Yes, huh. yes. Can you access these links? Uh, so I'll just go through them. Uh, so yeah, you just in case if I forget, just uh, you put it on the on the group as well. I, yeah, I just, just put it on the groups. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that will be better so everybody will see. Yes, yes, that's a good idea. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, yeah, Shatin, just stop sharing your slides. Uh, Dr. Yeah. Binod, sir, you're there? Yeah, I'm, I'm here. Can yeah, you yeah, hear me? Okay. <laughs> yes. So now we change gears and go to the guest lecture. We have a very um, well-known rheumatologist and a favorite of all the rheumatology groups dynamic. also. Dynamic. Dynamic, yes. And so Professor Vinod Ravindran, consultant rheumatologist, Center for Rheumatology at Calicut, Kerala. He's adjunct professor of medicine at KMC Manipal, Karnataka. And he trained at uh, Jaipur, did his MD medicine, then was at UK, did his MRCP, trained at King's College London, did his MRCP in rheumatology, we know him uh, as a, you know, uh, editor of multiple journals, past editor as a, of a in the journal of rheumatology, editor-in-chief. And uh, he's also the secretary-elect for Indian Rheumatology Association. He's got multiple awards to his credit. Today, he's going to speak on a very important topic related to pregnancy and autoimmune diseases and what are the problems, what are the potential solutions. On behalf of Maharashtra Rheumatology Association, I request uh, Dr. Vinod. Welcome, sir. And uh, thank you. Can you take over for your talk. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, uh, Kavita, ma'am. Uh, it's really uh, a pleasure uh, to be here virtually with Niharika, ma'am, Vajinti, ma'am, Praveen, you, and all the students and other colleagues from Maharashtra. And I thank uh, Maharashtra Rheumatology Association for this kind invitation. So let me start sharing and overcome the first challenge, which is the technical challenge of getting this going. Oh, hang on. Okay. Too far out. Sorry. Yeah, so that's the... Okay, so is it working fine, ma'am? Uh, yeah, yeah. You think first slide has come. Yes, sir. That's Second right. is coming, right? Okay. Yeah, the yes. beach and yeah. all, yes. Yeah, yes. thank you. Yes, so, so yeah, I, 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 so, so I'm based here in Calicut, um, which is called Kori Code now. And a uh, um, lot of our colleagues from Maharashtra have already been here. So I just re remind you that it's famous for its beautiful beaches, uh, spices, unique art forms. And uh, Calicut was the place where, uh, you know, in 1498, Vasco da Gama landed. So, uh, hoping to welcoming you on your next visit to these parts. And just to say that uh, it was mentioned that uh, the three journals uh, I have been associated with and I am associated with. So, do look them up uh, for your uh, next suitable publication. So this is the brief of my talk, and uh, I've been made aware that uh, mostly uh, students I'll be focusing it to. Uh, the purpose of this talk is uh, to have sort of a, a more uh, sort of a scoping uh, sort of you know review, um, and to bring um, all of us up to date to some of the issues and challenges we are facing in. Um, um, when it comes to the topic of pregnancy and rheumatic diseases. So I um, hope that some of the things uh, must not be new to you, and whereas some of the things would, would be new for you and uh, you know, it will hopefully keep you interested. So, so one of the challenges we face in rheumatology is the fact that um, a lot of rheumatological diseases, autoimmune diseases are 
far common in women than men. Uh, it is beyond the scope of this talk to dwell upon the various reasons for that, but I would um, uh, request you to consider reading these two publications on this particular subject. Linked to that is the challenge that because our patients are mostly women or a majority of them are women, um, we had to face in our day-to-day -day practice uh, women who are contemplating pregnancy, uh, who have become pregnant, or those who are in the postpartum phase, um, lactating or not lactating. So the first challenge in uh, pregnancy-related aspects, and when I mention pregnancy, I am referring to all the three phases of pregnancy, that is the preconception phase, uh, the pregnancy itself, and the postconception phase, uh, which is um, a lactation and beyond. So when we consider pregnancy in the context of autoimmune rheumatological diseases, we had to consider um, the intricacies, um, or peculiar sort of intricacies, uh, which have a very big uh, major bearing on uh, this relationship between autoimmune rheumatic diseases and pregnancy. So uh, to start with, uh, there is a spectrum of musculoskeletal or rheumatological problem a pregnant woman can have. Uh, it would range from uh, mostly benign non-autoimmune conditions to um, uh, well-recognized pregnancy-associated associated risk, um, enhancing diseases such as lupus or APS. And in between, you have uh, uh, problematic but not so uh, disastrous for both pregnant women or fetus, such as rheumatoid arthritis. Now, these diseases can be developing for the first time in a pregnant woman, or it could be a pre-existing disease which has become worsened uh, or become quiescent during the pregnancy. So when you consider the non-autoimmune diseases in pregnancy, um, there are several um, physiological and mechanical factors which contribute to development of uh, non-autoimmune musculoskeletal diseases in pregnancy, such as the release of hormones such as estrogen relaxin will lead to ligamentous laxity, and they can have joint hubbub mobility related symptoms and signs. There could be fluid retention, which could cause entrapment neuropathies, joint effusion, um, which if you are not careful may be taken as um, uh, arthritis. Uh, there is a remarkable weight gain uh, throughout the pregnancy, especially during the third trimester, which can lead to mechanical stress on the joints, causing uh, low back pain and knee pain. Uh, there is alter center of gravity um, because of the growing, enlarging fetus and compound um, with the fact that uh, the abdominal muscles are now loose, it can also put a mechanical load on the lumbar spine. There is loss of medial arch of the foot um, that can cause um, problems such as plantar fasciitis. Now, it is important to recognize these non autoimmune neurological conditions during pregnancy because um, mostly as the pregnancy is over, these diseases or these problems will fade away. So key here is to educate the patient, educate the patient about posture training, use splint physiotherapy, and symptomatic treatment uh, with or without simple analgesics or appropriate anti-inflammatory agents. And uh, because some of these conditions have a uh, tendency to recur and during subsequent pregnancy, it is important to ask about uh, the history of any problems, musculoskeletal problems during the uh, previous pregnancy. Now, so this is the list of non-autoimmune musculoskeletal conditions commonly encountered during the pregnancy. And as I said, ranging from low back pain uh, to miscellaneous such as thoracic plantar fasciitis, uh, these are seen. And you have entrapment neuropathies, um, you have tenosynovitis, um, you have some purely radiological um, 
problems or features which can confound uh, a pre-existing diagnosis or impact on a new diagnosis being correctly made, such as sacroiliitis. Um, most of these conditions, as I said, are amenable to rest, uh, splintage, analgesia, or appropriate anti-inflammatory agents, physiotherapy. But there are a couple of conditions which we are not aware, and if we do not um, uh, treat appropriately, can cause uh, major damage. One of them is transient osteoporosis of the hip. It usually presents during the third trimester. Um, it uh, it um, increases, the pain increases during the weight bearing, but normally at rest, it is fine and it is usually uh, unilateral. Now, if we allow this lady to continue to weight bear uh, because of the uh, bone demineralization, there is a liability that it might fracture. So bed rest is one of the key uh, treatment for this. And bisphosphonate use is though controversial during the pregnancy, it has been used and so is calcitonin. But the good thing is that it, after the delivery, it resolves uh, completely as this um, uh, case report has shown. So you can see the transient osteoporosis of the hip, bilateral hips, and after the pregnancy, a complete resolution. Another condition which can cause pain in the hip, but is actually nasty if left untreated or undetected is the avascular necrosis of the hip. So again, it will happen either during the third trimester or within uh, first four weeks of giving birth. And uh, this is a pain which is worse at night or at rest compared to the transient osteoporosis of the hip. And here the MRI is diagnostic. Um, and, and this is a plain X-ray photograph of a, a different person who had avascular necrosis of the hip. Now, as opposed to the transient osteoporosis of the hip, which is a self-limiting condition, avascular necrosis of the hip is progressive. So um, because this is happening during the first, sorry, the last trimester of the pregnancy, um, the idea is to use appropriate anti-inflammatory agents, avoid weight bearing, to prevent further necrosis. But once, um, um, uh, once the um, delivery is complete, a postpartum code of decompression of the hip is uh, to be considered. Now, coming to the autoimmune rheumatic diseases in pregnancy, there are several diseases to consider. On one end, you have rheumatoid arthritis, um, which was thought to be behaving uh, normally or without any big problem during the pregnancy, but now we know that uh, only about 50% of the patients will actually remain in remission during the pregnancy, and rest 50% of them will have some sort of problems during the pregnancy. Fortunately, compared to rheumatoid arthritis and psoriatic arthritis, um, things remain pretty much fairly stable. Lupus is, of course, one of the major focus of my talk, and I will um, deal with that in subsequent uh, part of the presentation. You all know that scleroderma can cause peculiar problems uh, during the pregnancy. Uh, the dreaded one is renal crisis, and also um, because of the pulmonary arterial hypertension, um, the problem with third trimester related cardiovascular fluid overload. Ankylosing spondylitis um, has the tendency of flaring up in the first trimester of the pregnancy, and it is mostly related to uh, lack of adequate disease control before pregnancy, and also lack, uh, and also um, probably too rapid withdrawal of anti-TNF agents if they were on that. And APS, of course, is very tricky, um, and I will not be dealing uh, with this because this is a topic of a separate talk. So just few things to highlight the intricacies, as I said. Um, so if you consider rheumatoid arthritis, um, what this slide show is that if somebody has inactive disease, that is a well-controlled disease, 75% would become pregnant. And if they have high disease activity, the chances of successful pregnancy is only 25%, okay? So 
the key message from this slide, slide is that high disease burden results in long time, longer time to pregnancy. Um, so it is imperative that pregnancy is planned during the uh, well-controlled phase of the pregnancy. Then it, what happens during the postpartum? A lot of diseases, rheumatoid arthritis, to lupus, psoriatic arthritis, they all flare up during the postpartum phase. Um, this could be related to the lack of uh, hormonal influences, um, poor management of drugs during the pregnancy, and also uh, such as in rheumatoid arthritis, presence of um, typical antibodies, but mostly it is poor disease control at the time of conception and uh, uh, stopping the anti-TNF treatment too soon um, after becoming pregnant. So these are the few um, issues which can lead to postpartum flare of an existing rheumatological condition. In lupus, as I said, it's very uh, complex. Um, so disease activity, the use of drugs and presence of specific antibodies, including um, the ROLA antibodies can impact on uh, all the phases of pregnancy, that is preconception, pregnancy, and postpartum. And uh, related to the disease flare, uh, the problems with the medication, and uh, if it is happening, the recurrent, pre recurrent pregnancy losses can impact on the psychological health of the mother. Um, related to that is the issue is what will happen to the next pregnancy because subfertility is also one of the main features features and of course increased disease activity, um, poor maternal outcome in terms of um, uh, preterm labor and all that, I'll discuss that, and also um, impact on the lactation and subsequent pregnancy. So there are a lot of features when it comes to lupus and uh, the pregnancy. So, so that's why, I mean, discussing lupus in the context of, uh, discussing lupus in the context of pregnancy perhaps covers almost all aspects of reproductive rheumatology. So uh, staying on lupus, if you consider the maternal and fetal uh, 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 impact of um, lupus, um, you can see that the maternal mortality rate increases tremendously in uh, pregnancy. And also the rates of preeclampsia is higher. Lupus flare fortunately is rare, 20%. Mostly it is related to musculoskeletal or hematological systems, but in 20%, it can be very severe and it might uh, be lupus nephritis happening for the first time. If you consider its impact on the fetus, you have very high rate of preterm birth, uh, interuterine growth retardation, low birth weight, instrumentational deliveries, such as cesareans or ventus, forceps, uh, but fortunately, if you look at the recent studies over the last decade, um, the live birth rate are quite high, 80%. But uh, do remember that these are mostly instrumental instrumentation deliveries, um, either cesarean section or use of ventus or forceps. And then there is a, a known, uh, though small risk of new neonatal lupus who have typical antibodies in these ladies. So now if we uh, were to consider the intricacies, why sort of this happens uh, in the pregnancy in general, particularly lupus pregnancy, uh, what we have to understand is that um, the placenta is the um, absolutely key factor uh, as far as the successful pregnancy outcome is concerned. So healthy placenta is the link between the fetus and the mother, and it's the source of all the nutrients, all the immunological mechanisms. Um, um, and if a placenta is not healthy, uh, then there could be a range of problem um, listed here. That is preeclampsia, intrauterine fetal growth retardation, small for gestational age, placental abruption, and stillbirth. So these are all the consequences of placental ischemia and insufficiency. So now they are uh, grouped together as maternal placental syndrome, MPS. And uh, I'll show you that how these um, things are actually uh, interlinked. Now in the obstetric literature, um, these um, pregnancy outcomes are 
you know, thought to be um, represent chronic placental inflammation. Uh, but in rheumatology, at least when these placenta from affected women were subjected to histopathological examination, no significant signs of placental inflammation was found. Um, so if at all it is inflammation, it is um, somewhere else than placenta. Um, but, but this is an emerging concept within uh, the obstetrics in the context of recurrent pregnancy losses. Now, the science of placental insufficiency uh, can be picked up in ut uterine artery uh, Doppler. You can see the, the notching, which happens um, around 16 to 24 weeks. Um, now, like all the ultrasound-related procedures, this is also operator-dependent, so not a very reliable thing to, um, um, to sort of... Um, be confident upon because you have a pregnancy being evaluated for its successful outcome. So as things goes, do we have reliable biomarkers which can tell us whether there is a, there is a potential of maternal placental syndrome happening? Um, so there are a few candidate biomarkers. Um, this is the soluble endoglin, and this is a soluble um, FMS-like tyrosine kinase one and the placental growth factor. Um, so, so this is a complex pathway, and you can see that this placental ischemia is absolutely uh, the major starting point. And down the cascade, uh, all the things you see is fetal growth restriction, um, then you have something uh, which is very similar to HELP syndrome, hypertension, proteinuria. Uh, this is all sort of uh, preeclampsia, eclampsia, IUGR, and HELP syndrome. Um, so, so these are the candidate biomarkers which are being actually used in some of the units, um, like this one. So uh, this fluorescine kinase, uh, tyrosine kinase um, uh, um, one uh, increases between 12 to 15 week of gestation in uh, women who have SLE related problems uh, potentially coming on. And uh, the endoglin and placental growth factor can also be either increased or decreased depending on what agent it is between 16th and 19th week of gestation uh, during. Uh, telling us that these are the potentially um, uh, uh, problematic scenarios in a lady who is uh, pregnant and has lupus. Um, so the advantage of these biomarkers, you can see that it's fairly early on, you get a good idea of uh, what's going to happen to the pregnancy. And then the key would be how to deal with that. Further on, if you consider the immunology of the pregnancy, uh, it is interesting because the fetus is semi-allograft. It means that half of the genetic material of the fetus comes from the mother, which is not a problem, but half of it comes from the father, which body perceives as an allograft and body tries to reject it. Now, in a normal pregnancy, there are mechanisms which will dampen down this immunological process which is trying to reject the fetus. Um, so in lupus, uh, these mechanisms are not that robust. So what happens, the pregnancy is rejected. And, and this is basically in a nutshell um, uh, of what this slide shows. The T regulator cells are important. But you can see that during the pregnancy, a lot of things um, uh, in normal pregnancy um, immunologically are actually altered. And the purpose of this alteration is to ensure that there is no fetal rejection takes place. But in lupus, um, almost in all the parameters, you can see it is going in the opposite direction. The key is the, uh, the reduction in the numbers of T regulator cells. And the end result is either pregnancy-related adverse outcomes, including uh, preeclampsia, 
um, and uh, 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 IUGR and even IUD. So having understood these intricacies uh, in the context of known uh, autoimmune rheumatic diseases, um, other question comes is, is there a way where we can identify at risk individual? That is before they develop a clinically manifest disease, that is at the preclinical stage. Um, so a bi-directional association between the autoimmune rheumatic diseases and pregnancy is well recognized because as I discussed, some of the conditions may come on um, uh, during the pregnancy or most of the known autoimmune rheumatic diseases before pregnancy would flare up during the pregnancy. So something is happening during the pregnancy to all these diseases. But what about an individual who hasn't got the disease yet and becomes pregnant? Um, and what if this individual has um, what is called all the ingredients of developing autoimmune diseases in the future? So in the context of women um, who develop autoimmune rheumatological diseases more frequently compared to men, uh, there are gender-related factors, that is hormones, estrogen, progesterone, and the imbalance of it. Um, the number of X chromosomes, which is more in women, and autoantibodies, um, the prevalence of autoantibodies such as ANA is much more compared to normal population in women. And there are pregnancy related factors, again, hormones and altered immune response. Um, in the presence of a normal, uh, in the presence of either uh, the relevant genetic alteration, smoking, infection, or the gut, uh, microbiota, we know that individuals can develop autoimmune rheumatic diseases. So you have gender related factors, you have pregnancy related factors, and you have underlying factors, which are not only uh, relevant to uh, uh, pregnant women, or the women in general, but the normal population, uh, individual develops what is called asymptomatic autoimmunity. Here, there are no overt symptoms, uh, but there are autoantibodies. And it's been shown that these individuals have adverse pregnancy outcomes, even before developing the full clinical disease. The next phase going further from the asymptomatic autoimmunity is the symptomatic autoimmunity, where there is alteration in the autoantibody production. And here the individual may have mild symptoms. And clinical disease, we all know that they will have cytokines and they will have not just the symptoms, but signs of known autoimmune rheumatological conditions. Um, this can, so from the asymptomatic autoimmunity, there can be no further progression. And also from the same symptomatic autoimmunity, an individual can not may not necessarily go on to develop clinical disease because in between there could be complete resolution of the symptoms. So this is the sort of you know, whole uh, thing about uh, the impact of pregnancy on preclinical pre autoimmune diseases. Now, how do I identify this uh, you know, preclinical phase related factors to pick up at risk individual meaning those ladies who do not have the disease as yet, but they may have autoimmune rheumatological diseases in the preclinical phase and how to prevent adverse pregnancy outcomes for that. There are two problems. One is the time lag. So the, the time lag is indefinite um, between the onset of uh, mild symptoms and a development of full-blown clinical disease. So that is a, of course a problem. And then the symptoms themselves and also the autoantibodies can be present only transiently in a lot of these women. So relying on any one aspect is not going to be sufficient when we try to pick up these individuals. So adverse pregnancy outcomes, I have already said in that um, discussion related to that preclinical disease slide that adverse pregnancy outcomes are uh, known to occur in individuals who have preclinical autoimmune rheumatic diseases. 
Of course, we don't know what is the precise influence of pregnancy on progression of preclinical autoimmune rheumatic diseases. But if we include uh, in our history taking a thorough obstetric history also, uh, which covers the adverse pregnancy outcomes, including spontaneous abortions, preeclampsia, IUGR, small for gestational age, placental abruption, and stillbirth, it will tell us whether there was um, you know, uh, any APO which might or might not be linked with a preclinical rheumatic disease. So, so this aspect of our history taking in our overall approach to pregnant women um, um, who have a subclinical or preclinical autoimmune rheumatic diseases is important. Now, once the lady has become pregnant, uh, the problem, uh, the challenge comes that how to differentiate flare from the normal. So on this side, you can see that there are um, uh, features which are common to a normal pregnancy, such as a bit of malar flush, arthralgia, as I said, because of the mechanical and uh, um, uh, hormonal changes. Um, uh, they can have low platelets, bit of anemia, hypertension, protein urea, and all that. So how do you differentiate? So of course, you know, the presence of a definite synovitis um, and also uh, new leukopenia, but importantly, rising teeters of into double standard DNA antibodies, um, a reduction in complement level. Uh, these all are uh, more reliable signs of something being wrong with the normal, so-called normal pregnancy. If you would like to consider the differentiation of preeclampsia, HELP syndrome, and ectilopus nephritis, there are a few things which uh, help. Um, so as preeclampsia and HELP syndrome are uh, related to the age of gestation, ectilopus nephritis can happen at any time. Uh, the complements are typically decreased here. And then, of course, there would be thrombocytopenia and neutropenia. But important is active segment would be present in active lupus nephritis and the double standard uh, DNA antibodies jitter would be rising. Um, and also um, the abnormal liver function would be absent in active lupus nephritis, which is variably present in all this. So, so that is pretty straightforward once you know it. Sometimes pregnancy can throw up uh, some of uh, uh, less known problems, such as this lady who had lupus, and this was at the 32nd week of pregnancy, that was way back in 2010, uh, came to us. Um, and as you can see, she had swinging pyrexia. So those were the days of H1N1. So, um, and of course, you know, this was the first pregnancy um, with lupus for this lady. So it was a precious pregnancy. And um, she had everything tested as uh, normally we do, um, but nothing came back as positive and she had antibiotics and all that. And this pyrexia continued unabated. Then ultimately it stuck us that uh, this has to be lupus pyrexia. Um, and all the medications were stopped. She was given uh, one single shot of intravenous methylprednisolone, 500 milligram. And uh, the fever completely uh, went away. And uh, this is basically when she stayed in the hospital for next three days. And this is uh, the telephonic follow-up, which we continue to do. And happily, she developed a healthy um, baby girl without any problems. So this is lupus pyrexia, which can happen during the pregnancy also. Then the next challenge is which drugs to consider. Now, of course, this could be a sort of a very long part of the talk, but I'll make it very short. One quiz uh, for the postgraduates is that, uh, what is so unique about this portrait? So, okay, I hope that most of you got it right. And um, so two things, you know, this is a male lupus. So um, male lupus, uh, it is just a reminder that when we talk about reproductive rheumatology, pregnancy and all that, we should not forget the men. And men also uh, develop lupus fairly commonly. And uh, this uh, is basically um, where 
Um, this is to show that the use of hydroxychloroquine in one such uh, individual uh, way back um, over 200 years ago. Now, the duct safety in pregnancy has been um, uh, sort of fairly exhaustively reviewed. And this is the 2021 ACR publication. Um, you can see, yeah, I put it here. So we all know that uh, these drugs are safe, hydroxychloroquine, sulfasalazine, colchicine, azathioprine, they are all safe during all the three phases of pregnancy. Prednisolone, we have to keep the dose as low as possible, but definitely less than 20 milligram per day. Um, some of the drugs can be used, but then you have to be extra cautious um, in terms of monitoring them, uh, such as here with cyclosporin and tacrolimus, their blood pressure. And then anti-inflammatory agents are, uh, the, cyclo, the COX inhibitors are not preferred, but you can, can continue to use the anti-inflammatory drugs during the, uh, the first two trimesters of the pregnancy. When it comes to anti, uh, sort of uh, anti-TNF agents, um, uh, most of them can be continued, but then they have to be stopped uh, before, um, or during the early phase of the third trimester. Now, update on that is the BSR guidelines, which were published last year. And uh, uh, this is um, the IRASIG's um, outcome. So very nice uh, um, um, infographic made by um, Hari Reddy. Um, so you got prednisolone, hydroxychloroquine, sulfur cells in the therpin, uh, cyclosporin, and colchicine, IVIG, are safe. TNF inhibitors are, um, can be sort of continued to be used, but then they, of course, as I said, they had to be stopped um, just before or during the third phase of the pregnancy. And the other drugs also, some of the other biologics also you can use. Um, you can use um, cyclophosphamide where there is um, overwhelming uh, concern about the safety of the mother or the fetus. Um, but these are the drugs which are unsafe. So methotexate, luflonamide, mycophenolate, uh, COX-2 inhibitors, cyclophosphamide, and of course, uh, tofacitinib, bazocitinib, because we do not have any data. Eprimela, same reason, agritimod, same reason and all the other biologics are not considered to be safe during the pregnancy because we do not have the evidence. When it comes to the lactation phase, all, almost the same um, principles uh, are advised to be uh, used. If because of any chance, any reason you had to use the prednisolone at a higher dose, um, it is advised to discard the breast milk for the first four hours and then uh, continue to use it um, throughout the day after the ingestion of prednisolone at a dose higher than uh, the mentioned here. Now, this is uh, fairly also well known. I expect uh, our postgraduates would know this. Uh, safe to use for the, uh, the uh, hypertension is uh, labetalol, methyl dopa, hydralzine and loop diuretics, um, ACE inhibitors or ARDs, ethanolol, spironolactone should not be used during the pregnancy. The exception to this is um, if you have, unfortunately, a lady um, with scleroderma renal crisis during the pregnancy. So here, the risk to the uh, mother is far more uh, if the disease is left untreated. So in these scenarios and all, all the scenarios related to pregnancy, it is the mother's health which will take precedence. So here, uh, you know, you have to use um, the ARDs or ACE inhibitors. But this is not the real challenge. As a rheumatologist, we all know about uh, the drugs inside out. Um, what is safe, what is not safe. The problem is, uh, the access to the correct information to people who actually need it, and that is the pregnant women. Now, this was a smart study um, uh, from US, and those small numbers, very interesting, I found. So here you look at, so the patients perceived as safe. Now, the rheumatologists knew it, that they are all safe, 
okay? And probably they all have been given correct advice about uh, these medications to the patients. But uh, you can see that there is a large sort of discrepancy between what the experts thought about the duct safety and what the patient actually thought about the duct safety. And no wonder um, these uh, women would actually stop these medications and that will lead to flare and adverse pregnancy outcome. Now, from where these women were getting information? So, of course, as rheumatologists, probably, you know, we had done our part. We have read all the infographics, ACR, BSR, um, you know, the guidelines, and we have prescribed. Uh, but women have their own concerns about the duct safety. And, and this is US, so you can see that uh, the educational barriers are probably not that much as we expect to see in India. But still interesting is that they rely on uh, medication package information. Now, when was the last time uh, you yourself had any medical medication package information uh, you, know, um, you have read? I, I don't recall. Um, at least in the recent past, reading a medications package myself. And expecting our pregnant women in India to reach the medication package for the relevant information, I think um, uh, uh, sort of very optimistic. Then the second source of information for them was pharmacists, meaning a pharmacist telling them about the, what is called the, you know, the pharmacological counseling. And this is also uh, not widely prevalent in India. Uh, we have scenarios where uh, sort of, you know, it is prescribed in good faith from a physician's end, and then of course it is stopped at the pharmacist or some confusion comes up and then of course you, know, you have to resolve that. Now, online sources. So in the today's age, it is going to be the major sort of source of information. And you can see that social media, um, the websites, which are not that sort of, you know, above board, um, online forums and blogs, which do not have any sort of, uh, you know, uh, 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 sort of, you know, claim to have um, scientifically appropriate uh, information. These are the major source of information for pregnant women. So I think uh, this is one aspect we have to think about when it comes to a safe medication in pregnancy, that the barriers are actually beyond uh, our clinic. And what about men? So we talked about uh, rheumatology and sort of reproductive rheumatology and its impact on um, the women or the disease impact on pregnant women. Um, what is the impact of pattern information? So, what if, if the male develops rheumatological problem uh, before pregnancy of their partners? So this was a cross-sectional study um, in Netherlands and uh, nearly 900 pregnancies were studied. And you can see it's very straightforward that if pregnancy is after the diagnosis of inflammatory arthritis, so the rate of miscarriages is much more. So if the men has the diagnosis of inflammatory arthritis, um, the pre subsequent pregnancy will have much more uh, chances of miscarriage. And this is after all the sort of confounding factors were adjusted. Further on, if you look uh, from this same study, uh, what is the final number of children per man? So that is the desired number. So let's say the male says, I want to have a family with three kids, but ultimately, after the diagnosis of inflammatory arthritis, they have only one kid. So that is the desired number versus the final number. So you can see that at any age, uh, the, the final number of um, children in such uh, men are far less compared to the desired. Okay, so this is the desired and this is the actual number. So this is, so this is to say that uh, the the autoimmunological rheumatological condition in men affects the pregnancy outcome in uh, their female partners. Now, in this editorial, we sort of try to summarize the factors 
uh, which influences on the uh, reproductive health um, in males. So in this dark blue are the factors which have been well studied. So we know the impact of genetic factors, alcohol, smoking, obesity, age on uh, sort of um, the pregnancy, the, the, the conception, and also the subsequent sort of, you know, um, pregnancy outcome. But in the light blue, we do not know what happens to the sperm quality. And we know that the sexual dysfunction happens in men who have autoimmune rheumatological diseases, but do not know the full impact of that. Compared to women, for the same reasons, for men, we do not know, fully know what is the impact of medications. Uh, and of course, how the mental effect, health of these individuals who have painful uh, rheumatological conditions uh, affect on the reproductive health. So these are the, uh, the known and yet unknown or not yet well-studied factors as far as uh, reproductive rheumatology in men are concerned. Then what about the registries? So one thing you have to understand about the registries is that, um, so I'll just go through this one first. So this was a fairly big uh, registry data. So uh, in Sweden and Denmark, um, they combined the two uh, registries. And then you can see that um, nearly 1,800 rheumatoid arthritis pregnancies and close to 17,000 17, controlled pregnancies. And this study showed that uh, the overall risk ratio for preterm birth and small for gestational age in RA pregnancy was higher. But the problem with registries is that we have to understand that these are not purpose built. The information in these registries are indirectly derived because either they are designed to study the adverse effect or teratogenicity of uh, some medication or they are uh, insurance related uh, databases where uh, there will be insurance claim records. Um, but these registries would generally exclude um, the data which we need for pregnancy and autoimmune rheumatic diseases. Like what was the disease activity? What were the relevant autoimmunological profile? And what medications were used, not only used, when they were stopped and what was the reason for that? Because now we are trying to link the use of a particular type of drug with uh, some adverse pregnancy outcome. And so they are generally excluded for interventional studies uh, because all the right reasons. So registries have to be relied upon, but not in the way um, uh, which they are being used. So. Um, this was another editorial we were invited to um, uh, write about that sort of, you know, what an ideal um, reproductive rheumatology registry should have. One thing, it has to be prospective. It cannot be retrospective. And then it has to have the data related to all the three phases of pregnancy. And then apart from the basic character characteristics, it has to have specific details out about the autoimmune rheumatological diseases activity components. And of course, the antibodies, as I said, and a parity of obstetric history, because we had just discussed that APOs in the previous pregnancies are important. Then during pregnancy, data related to fetal health, maternal health, maternal disease, maternal disease uh, related drugs, uh, their start dose, date, and cessation date, reason. And then in the postpartum phase, what was the pregnancy outcome, list everything, neonatal health, breastfeeding issues, and then of course, disease related characteristics. So some of them are being recorded in these registries. And these are the areas which we must sort of include in this prospective registries was our recommendation. Then pregnant women have difficulty traveling to your clinics to provide this data. So in uh, the digital health technologies, uh, especially the wearables and all that, you can um, hopefully in near future design something which will allow these pregnant patients to feed in the data sitting at their home uh, into your registries. 
Now, finally, coming to the Indian context. So, when we looked at the various reasons for um, poor pregnancy outcome in lupus in India, these are uh, the few uh, issues we identified. Um, lack of preconception counseling, poor adherence to the medication, follow-ups, and unplanned pregnancy. So they are becoming pregnant when the disease is activity. It's absolutely a recipe for disaster. But if you look at the reason for this, um, there are many sort of things. We do not have a multidisciplinary setup at all the uh, center and hospitals and clinics. And among our other colleagues, including the obstetrician, perhaps there is inadequate knowledge and awareness about lupus pregnancies. And I will expand that to include all the autoimmune hematological diseases. So, so these are the barriers. Then, of course, involving you as a rheumatologist is um, at a late stage is also one of the big problems. So finally, in this particular um, editorial, um, we were asked to sort of you know, give our thoughts about how to optimize care for pregnancy in rheumatic diseases. And there are several things I would not go you with the details, but you can see that at the patient's level, the healthcare professional that is our level and at the resource level, there are multiple barriers, um, which are all sort of unique to where you work. But there are solutions like if, there is a lack of awareness, then you have to uh, undertake patient education programs. The regular counseling is also one of the ways. Empowering your colleagues who are not rheumatologists um, is important. But whatever you do, um, you can come up with a service model for your own local area. And if that happens, then it requires active engagement in terms of its continuous monitoring, appropriate usage, and also do revisions and of helping and supporting to weed out logistical issues so that uh, the, the, uh, not only the service becomes robust, but it remains viable for all of us. So uh, final couple of slides to say that reproductive rheumatology has uh, known to be um, a well-recognized um, subspecialty interest in rheumatology. Um, the progress is happening uh, as far as the Indian rheumatology is concerned. Um, you all know that an IRA, Reproductive Rheumatology Special Interest Group, has been formed. And based on our first meeting, which we had last year at Indore, uh, work is in progress. Um, when a couple of surveys uh, were discussed at this, one is uh, heading towards a publication. And um, CMEs, our colleagues have done, are doing where there is a, a vision to have a rheumatology obstetrician interface. And uh, the work is also in progress to create a prospective registry. And I hope to keep you posted on all of this in the near future. So uh, my conclusions are that the musculoskeletal problems in pregnant women should be assessed from both being a possibility of non-autoimmune rheumatological disease and also uh, autoimmune rheumatological diseases either happening for the first time or pre-existing. Pre um, the key focus in terms of achieving a successful pregnancy outcome in this woman to have a well-controlled disease prior to the conception. And uh, this is again an area within rheumatology where teamwork is required. So I think with that, I would like to conclude and thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ravindra. The fantastic lecture, your excellent flow from non autoimmune rheumatic diseases to the rheumatic overview, then a lot of it about lupus, and then the importance of registries and the teamwork. We have a few questions in the chat box, if it's okay with you. Yeah. What about tocilizumab in pregnancy? Can you hear, sir? Yeah, just a minute. Just bring that slide up so that. Yeah. So, anyway, 
So, um, so all other biologics, apart from NTTNF and uh, Tuximab, as I said, um, they, uh, they are not recommended to be used during the pregnancy. That is the, that's the key thing. Okay. So, so you have uh, NTTNF agents, which can be used during the pregnancy. Um, uh, but again, NTTNF agents had to be uh, discontinued uh, before, at the, or during the third trimester, or just before the third, third trimester, depending on what type of, uh, and then of course, rituximab may be used, uh, but generally all the other sort of NTTNF agents, uh, other, sorry, all the other biological agents are uh, not uh, sort of considered to be safe. But, is not recommended. But the pro proviso is that it may be considered, as you can see the disclaimer here, it may be you considered to manage severe maternal disease if there is no other pregnancy compatible drugs are suitable. I think the message uh, I want to uh, emphasize upon is that uh, using the context of cyclophosphamide, cyclophosphamide we know that is contraindicated in pregnancy. But if you have a situation where nothing else works, you have to weigh the risk to the mother uh, about everything else and uh, plan uh, the sort of, you know, the safer therapeutics in that context. Another question is, is there a cumulative dose of cyclophosphamide dose cut off or would monitor for follicles or hormonal profile? When would you recommend use of growth hormone, GNRH analog? Ma'am, uh, yes, you know, so the, I think the, the preservation or what is called the um, egg preservation and all that can be used. I'm not aware of any sort of, you know, monitoring during the pregnancy or cumulative dose of pregnancy uh, for cyclophosphamide, uh, if, uh, which is happening. So, so I had to give it a pass. With belimumab and anifrumumab, et cetera, which is not available here, but if it comes here or how is it abroad, are the pregnancy outcomes in lupus becoming more favorable? Okay, so in general, ma'am, uh, even in India, the and for sort of for my center also, the pregnancy outcomes have become uh, uh, very um, good in the last 10 years globally. Um, I had shown you a slide where compared to a decade or now it will be 15, 20 years where the maternal mortality rate was 20% or close to 20%, things have improved much now. And if, the, if you look at the recent uh, studies, the live birth rate is actually 80% in, in, mm -hmm. in lupus yes. pregnancies. Now, the second question was related to the two drugs which are not available in India. Now, uh, as far as I am aware, because of the reasons mentioned, uh, those drugs have not been studied in pregnancy. And in fact, the trials related to that did not have any pregnant population. So that is, that is the problem, um, uh, you know, uh, related to the safe therapeutics in pregnancy is concerned. The data comes from either accidental use um, uh, or when these drugs um, are considered to be safe later on because of some newer insights into pathophysiology. So if a mother has lupus and the daughter is planning to get pregnant, has no symptoms or signs of autoimmune disease, would you recommend screening and what screening would you recommend? And we know that these conditions are not sort of, you know, uh, genetic that way. Um, so, so this is a tricky area. Now, if this lady has any sort of symptoms, mild symptoms, uh, then there is a justification to test her for um, lupus-related antibodies, um, APS also, uh, because of the fact that she has mild symptoms and also, uh, you know, mother has lupus. But if uh, the, the patient is absolutely asymptomatic, um, there is, as far as I'm aware, there is little scientific sort of, you know, uh, 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 sort of called reason to, to screen her for that. 
Um, and then comes the question is, if suppose if she's tested and she is found to have a positive, positivity, then, then the whole sort of uh, increases. increases. Any other questions but, from the students? But if this lady, let's say, for example, this lady was not first tested for the first time and uh, she had an adverse pregnancy outcome. Hmm. Um, and then th this would be per perfectly reasonable, like in any other person, to test her for loop group related antibodies and APS. Absolutely. Any other questions from the students or the faculty? I think Dr. Rohini is here. Dr. Rohini, you're there? Yeah, yeah, Kavita. Uh, yeah, I, sure. I, I was I attending the lecture, and uh, you know, that was a very comprehensive talk. And uh, I mean, you're the right person, really. We've started this uh, initiative. And I really feel that, you know, educating the gynex and obstetrics or uh, having them on the same page is really also very important. And I think that's what you have probably you're working towards. And that in the long run will, you know, make a difference. So thanks, Vinod. I wanted to just say thank you for taking out time and coming for our uh, coming and educating our students and us, all of us. Thank you. Thank, thank you, ma'am. Always a pleasure. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for an excellent session today. A perfect blend of PG Clinic question answers and an awesome guest lecture. Thank you, Dr. Vinod. Thank you, all faculty and students. I will close the meeting. Yeah. Thank you. Thank Good day you. to all. Thank you. Good day.
पहली पहली बार सिखाता है यही सिखाता है यही
I'm not going to 